Hey everyone, Ponyo here. Thank you for tuning in to another episode of After Dinner Mints. I highly encourage everyone tuning in to join us in the Artblocks Discord. A link to our Discord can be found in the description of this video. As always, make sure you like, comment, and subscribe to our YouTube channel so you don't miss an episode of our weekly show. And now I want to introduce our guest for today. We have generative artist James Merrill. Hey, Panya. Thanks for having me. Yeah, thanks for being here. How are you doing today? I'm doing good. Really good. Excellent. Cool. Well, we got a lot to cover today. Uh, definitely want to dig into your project, Ori, which was released just a little bit ago. Um, but yeah, before we get there, maybe you can just tell us a little bit about your background. Yeah. Hey, everyone. I'm James Merrill. Um, I've been doing digital art really since like the mid 2000s. I started doing um, flash development back in the day. Got my copy, started learning how to do graphics and coding kind of at the same time, and really just got involved in the community and continued to just iterate on different styles that I thought were interesting. A lot of digital art from me started as static, and then I was building websites to showcase it. And then I took that and kind of brought it back together to start doing generative art, which has been a lot of fun. Um, I've really been focusing on it since 2018. And I feel like it really happened when I discovered Plotter Twitter, and I just had to be a part of that. So for many years, I really just focused on Plotter art, which is a very minimal version of generative art, typically not long form. And Ori was my first really foray into a long form generative art project. Very cool. And, you know, you mentioned the... the um... Twitter plotter that you kind of followed. Who are some other artists or what are some artists that you kind of looked up to and inspired your work early on? Yeah, there's a bunch of them. So I put together a little mood board actually that I'd love to show you of just kind yeah. of the work that really hit me different over the years. And if you look closely, I think you'll find that there are some things here that look like worry in a sense. So back in the 2000s, I got this Amon Tobin uh, CD called Out From Outwear. And the cover art and like the graphics and stuff just blew my mind so i just really loved that and it resonated with me and stuck with me and if you look at the line work it kind of actually might remind you of the line work in ori um and that was done by dj food i want to say <laughs> so he makes music and really cool artwork and it's really cool montovin's part of art blocks as well i need to say hey to that guy sometime um and then I got really fascinated with digital art for a long time. So this is a, a very early piece from Justin Mahler over here that's actually from 2003 that I remember seeing this just being so captivated with all the crazy like tech. Like we don't really do that anymore in digital art, but it was really cool at the time. And it got me just interested in doing graphics and also 3D. And then if I scroll down a bit, there's this artist, Sec, and his real name is, it's down there, Anti Sincello. Uh, and this is all quite old at this point, but just really interesting to me and was another kind of just moment where, you know, my mind was blown when I saw it. And again, there's like line work in here that just has always resonated with me. This is my buddy, David Masca. So he's a multi-talented, multifaceted digital artist. Uh, he does a lot of graffiti work. And then he also does really, really amazing illustrations. So this is a really early one from him, but I would encourage you to, to look at what he's doing these days. It's really cool. And then this is um, an individual known as Abstract Mix. And I don't even think he makes digital art anymore, but he kind of just came out with this style out of left field. And it just like blew my mind when I saw it because the color is just really vibrant and rich. And the forms are simple, but very dynamic and convey motion. So I really looked up to this individual for quite a long time. And then here's just some graffiti over the years I've looked at that have, you know, just really inspired my vision for my own artwork. Um, this is, I think, Ben's, and I'm pretty sure they're out of Australia. And again, I just really love the vibrant colors. I like the shapes and the forms. Um, so that's, yeah, some of the things that I just kind of over the years have collected on my own boards. I like to build them out. I, I like to find inspiration in multiple different places and then kind of put it away and revisit it every now and again. Very cool. That's awesome. And, and you know, what was your introduction into this NFT and, and crypto space that we're all a part of? Yeah, so back in like 
I think it was like February of 2021. Um, Justin Mahler, who, uh, you know, was really one of the founding members of Depth Core, kind of like he got involved and he brought everyone in that group along with him. So he set up a Discord for us. Uh, he was doing things with Nifty Gateway. So we were all kind of watching on the sidelines. And then he was kind enough to develop a relationship with them so that Depth Core could do a new chapter, which they hadn't done in a couple of years with nifty gateway so it was like me and a bunch of all these other digital artists who've been in the game for a really long time being able to in a way be guided into making nfts with someone who had experience doing it so once that happened i was like all right let's go like at first i was a little hesitant i wasn't really sure what this was all about and whether it was like a flash in the pan but it was really cool to do that and kind of have someone who you know had experience guide us and you know, find members of like this community who have been doing art for decades, just like back in it and uh, all contributing and working together again. That's awesome. And did you release any work on Nifty Gateway or is your first pieces that you released onto the blockchain through our blocks? Um, yeah, so I do have work on Nifty Gateway. So if you go back and look at the Death Core releases, you'll find some pieces from me. Cool. That's awesome. And actually, speaking of, you know, early work, do you mind sharing some of that early generative art pieces that you've created in the past? Yeah, totally. Yeah, so I've been doing digital art for a really long time. But in terms of generative art, I really got started, like I said, with plotter art. So I saw that hashtag, I knew I had to get involved. And where I really started is I had this idea of like, what if I could make an algorithm that, you know, would make these patterns, but the density was variable. So if I could do that, then I could make all these different patterns essentially. So like, you know, the spacing between the lines or how many coils the spiral has on it. If I could do that, then I could take that and map that to white and black bitmap images and make all sorts of crazy compositions. So this is like really where I started. And I really love the idea of like black paper and gold ink because it just like pops and it's kind of shiny and stuff. So a lot of my earlier work has that involved. So that's how I really got started. So I sat down and I downloaded processing and figured out how I could like output SVGs and started doing line work um, and just iterating on that idea. So if you look at like this circle here, um, the density kind of changes as you get into the lower right where the signature is. And in the upper left, it's much less dense in terms of its uh, white scale values. So you get that kind of cool effect. And then at one point I was kind of taking that idea and doing it with different colors. So I really kind of fell into loving the idea of like multicolored plots. So I would do essentially the same thing, but create gradients with this density. So like this one, for example, is four different colors and the density is distributed in a way where it kind of mixes the colors, which is a lot of fun. And then like a lot of people, I got really into just seeing what you could do with sine waves and trying to make your plotter draw like, you know, miles of pen line essentially. So a ton of really tight line work and then maybe slightly moving them around and tweaking them. And uh, you know, this one on the right's like that. And then the one on the left, the pen actually got like messed up in the middle of it. It created these crazy like streaks in the middle. And I just loved that effect. And that's when I really realized that generative art plus plotters adds this new dimension where when things go wrong, like sometimes the effects are kind of cooler than what you could potentially expect. So because of the physicality, there's all these variables that will happen. Like you're gonna run out of ink. Someone might bump your table, the power might go out, and you get kind of surprised in a good way when that happens. Sometimes. Other times it's very tedious. <laughs> um, I started playing around with the idea of systems that introduce chaos over time with this piece. So up top, if you look at it, it's very orderly. And then chaos starts to introduce as the system expands downward. So these little kind of bricks, I guess you could say, when there's few, there's very little mutation. And then as it gets down, they expand, which introduces the possibility of mutation. So they start like glitching out. Sometimes they disappear. And then they start like getting tweaked and kind of modified and more almost like hand drawn. So as you get to the bottom, it's a completely different image and you see that transition throughout. 
And a lot of times in my work, I try to play with the idea of like orderly systems that become chaotic over time. And this is probably the first piece where I was able to really capture that in a generative algorithm. Uh, so this, this one is called subdivider, and this is just subdividing rectangles, but putting interesting patterns inside of them and then playing around with coloring them. So sometimes this is where uh, I'll maybe draw this sketch with a plotter, then hand draw the colors or paint them with watercolor and then do another pass with the plotter and it leads to really cool results. Uh, this is also the last program I wrote in Java before I transitioned over to P5, which turned out to be a lot faster for iterating. And Java is more powerful sometimes, but JavaScript's faster for, you know, uh, quickly making new versions of things. So you don't have to wait for a comp compilation or anything like that. As I mentioned earlier, uh, this piece on the left, it was plotting and my power went out. So my plotter shut down and the results were way cooler than I could have expected. <laughs> so it's like half done and you get this crazy like pattern work in here that I still love. And I honestly don't even know if I could reproduce this at this point. So I haven't tried, um, but this one definitely stands out to me. And then, um, as I mentioned, the idea of kind of working with the machine and maybe having to draw a sketch for you to color in, I really tried to like lean into that for a while. So here's a kind of big example of that where it's a lot of like loose watercolor work and then very scientific, refined plotter art, generative art. And then where I feel like I've really hit my stride and I started doing things that other people hadn't really tried before is when I developed this program called Series of Tubes. So this is kind of the first pass at it. It almost looks like a circuit board, but the idea was that like these little lines would crawl around on the canvas and they would connect to one another and they'd be basically in segments. And each segment could be rendered in different ways. And the end result looks like this. And they're like highly detailed and people look at it and they're like, how did, how did you do that? And it's really just the idea of like, little tiny worms crawling around and then they get maybe like, you know, twisted or spun around. Um, and I came up with like, I think it was like 10 or 15 different ways that the little segments could be drawn and it led to these results. So it looks really complicated and it was, was kind of complicated to write because I wanted all the lines to always end up in the right places. But that's where I really felt like, all right, like I can do and say things with generative art that are, different and interesting and it really kind of took my path from doing generative art plus a lot of 3d art and digital art to really just like focusing on the generative stuff because it was just new and interesting to me and you could also have a physical version of it very easily so i did a lot of these and uh put, gave them out to friends or sold them or got a couple around my house etc that's awesome that's such a cool piece i have to ask now after seeing all these you know plotted pieces are is that something you want to you know try out in the future do a release that's specific to the pieces being plotted so that's a good question um i actually have done that so last november i did a release with feral file that was uh, me and lisa he and tyler hobbs and vega and a couple of other really amazing generative artists and it was basically 30 unique editions of an algorithm plus a plotter drawing and the coolest part is all the artists got one another's artwork. So I have like um, Alicia He and I have a Tyler Hobbs, which is just really sweet. And I continue yeah. to want to do that sort of thing. So with Ori in particular, we'll probably talk about it later, but there might be a flatter component to that as well. Love that. Well, yeah, let's jump into Ori. It seems like, you know, a lot of people are talking about it on Block Talk. I've, you know, spent a, a considerable amount of time just going through all the different outputs. And I've, I love everything I see, especially with the, we'll talk about it a little bit later on kind of like destroying the, the artwork at the end, which I truly, truly love. I think that's such a nice addition that you had to that project. Um, but on the website or on your uh, pro uh, project description, you said that Ori is a generative art project that combines themes that have deeply inspired my artistic pursuits. So in a way it's a biography of my evolution in art. Um, can you share some of these themes that you mentioned and you know, why are they important to this uh, specific project? Yeah, so there's really three themes in Ori, and that's origami, 
graffiti and digital art. And those are probably, if I had to pick out all the different things that I've been exposed to in the art world, my top three most interesting things that I've been into. And origami to me has always been just really interesting because it's like deeply mathematical in a sense, but it's also really creative and there are guides out there to do it, but you can kind of do it yourself too and invent new uh, models, that sort of thing. But the way that you just fold paper is to me very just, it's pleasing in a sense. And, you know, there's people who will fold like a thousand paper cranes and I've never done that. Like sometimes a good way to just like, you know, de-stress or take a moment is to kind of just sit down and fold something. So it's always resonated with me. And as a kid, like my mom was an art teacher. So it was like my bedroom and then her art supply room where she had all of her supplies. I would just like go in there afternoon, like after afternoon and just like get into stuff. And I definitely like, I think started really getting into paper folding there uh, and just occupying my time by like taking models and then like tweaking them. So like taking a crane, but giving it like an extra set of wings or like crazy, like airplane dynamics or all that kind of stuff. So that's where I really felt like I could just start to use my imagination to make stuff. Um, even though like origami is typically very much like you follow instructions to do things, you can kind of break out of that. Um, and then graffiti has always just been really interesting to me, like growing up in a city and seeing it around everywhere. I just love, you know, the flow style of it. I love the illegality of it. I love the idea of putting your name out there almost by force at times. I love the kind of like hidden element of it, the hierarchy of it. I've never really done it, but I'm a deep appreciator of it. And I think although there's like a lot of things that really resonate with me, the idea that people will like climb buildings illegally and spray paint like down the top of them to do what's called like a floater to me is just like some James Bond awesome stuff. So <laughs> I just love that. And then, you know, with digital art, it's just always been a part of my life. I'm surrounded by it in, in my art studio here. And it's just guides my aesthetic in a lot of ways. And I need to lean on that because again, like with plotter art, there's none of that. So with creating a long form digital generative art project, it's definitely going to tap into like my roots in, in digital art. And that's why it's one of the components of it. Cool. And you know what, I think you kind of touched on it just a little bit by talking about origami, but you know, what's the story behind the name Ori itself? Yeah, it's not nothing too crazy. I mean, it really was, I had a couple ideas in my head, but I wanted something that was simple and recognizable and just spoke to the project. And the project really started with the idea of, mimicking paper folding with math on computers. So it was kind of an easy one to choose. Cool. And, you know, you, you mentioned, or just looking in your project description, you mentioned growing up in Baltimore City where you were kind of surrounded by graffiti and it sounded like that was a huge impact in your artistic style. Um, you know, how did that impact your personal art form then while growing up? Was it something that was immediate or you know you kind of walked around and you know you kind of took it all in over time or yeah maybe talk to us a little bit about that yeah I, I would just share like one experience I had in Baltimore where I was like that's such a genius idea is there was this guy Eli and you see his tags like everywhere if you went to the gas station it'd be like scratch like etched into like where you see how much gas you got and all that and like that is what it is but one of the things that I thought was really hilarious and awesome that he did is we had this, uh, I think he was like a candidate for governor or something named Ehrlich. And it, he had all these bumper stickers everywhere. It's like, don't blame me. I voted for Ehrlich. So this guy, Eli, basically got a big stack of them and cut out part of the guy's name. So it said, like, don't blame Eli. And he just posted them up, like, all over the city. And I was like, I don't know why anyone would do that. I don't know why they care that much. But his name is out there. Now I remember it. And then I started recognizing other people's names everywhere. And I would look at, like, trains as I waited, you know, driving to work or whatever, going past the train station and seeing like, like graffiti from around the United States that's getting like propagated, right? And like, that's when I started to realize there was something there that was just really intriguing because it was all kind of like, you know, hidden away and most people don't like it. But if you know about it and you start looking around, there's like a wide difference between like crappy graffiti and the really good stuff. And the really good stuff will last and people won't touch it because there's like this hidden hierarchy behind it and if you do touch it 
then you're kind of you're going to get your stuff messed up right so it's just very very interesting subculture to me so you mentioned so something i really enjoyed was uh watching your trailer for your project ori on on i think it was i saw it first saw it on twitter and it was just really really well done it kind of showed you know graffiti spray cans a bunch of different art and kind of the outdoors and I think you kind of mentioned, touched on it just a little bit ago, but you, I, I was just curious, you know, have you ever considered doing graffiti work yourself or is that something you just uh, don't anticipate ever trying, just uh, enjoying from afar? Yeah, so I, I have tried it. Um, basically, in preparation for the launch of Ori, I realized that I was kind of getting ahead of myself. I was incorporating elements of graffiti without actually embedding myself in the culture or trying it. So I spent time with writers in Vermont and went out with them and kind of saw how they operated, went to spots, asked them about why they do it, what they think about it and all of that. And I definitely bought some spray paint cans and tried it myself. And it's way harder than I thought. Like you have to be very exact in how you hold the can and like how far away you hold it from the wall. And probably the most hilarious part is describing to some of these people what my goal was and that was to like break down the precision of algorithms by introducing a unwieldy spray can in a sense and they were like well we do the opposite we want it to be like complete like gradients to be perfect we don't want drips or spray anywhere like we want it to look really precise and it was kind of hilarious so yeah and it's really hard to do that so when i tried it my stuff was like all whack and i don't know if i'm gonna really get into it I want to, but it also is very smelly. So I was like getting headaches constantly. Um, (laughs) But I I love it as inspiration. So I was going to show actually, I have a couple of my digital art versions of kind of graffiti style abstract work that shows, you know, where my head's at uh, when it comes to like what I look for. So these were actually, it was a series on graffiti work that I released for Evoke One's final exhibit called Forever, somewhere around, I think, like 2015 or 16. And I wanted to take kind of my graffiti styles and my abstract styles and put them in scenes. So I basically digital painted the scenes and all the tags and everything else. And this was really fun, like to try to figure out how to do different styles of like hand styles and that sort of thing. So I just like immersed myself in kind of the different styles that exist. Because if you go to somewhere like Philadelphia, you're going to see graffiti that looks a lot different than maybe on the West coast. There's even graffiti in places like South Korea. So I would literally spend like hours driving around on Google maps in South Korea, trying to find the graffiti. Cause I was like, I want to find the weirdest graffiti, right? Like I want to find things that are very different than what I see just to get a better understanding of it, maybe in totality. And you can totally see here, uh, there's a lot of drip work here that is certainly reminiscent of what you'll find in Ori. And then finally, I chucked in a piece I did probably like 10 years ago called Sunrise Hands that's very much like painter-y and kind of has graffiti flow elements. where you get kind of that flowy style, right? Like I really love that. I try to incorporate that into my abstract art. Cool, I love that so much. And you know, I'm curious how you generate that actual spray can effect in your work. Is that something that, it, it, it just seems like, I'm, I'm not a coder myself, but it just seems like that would take a lot of like guess and checking and making sure, because when you spray something on a wall, not that I've you know, done that. It just seems like it's it's different every single time, you know, it kind of produces kind of a, a unique effect. Yeah, so exactly. And it's really hard to do right. And I'll show you kind of where I started and how I thought about it. So worry is comprised of pieces of geometry and they're really polygons. And a polygon is kind of like this shape here. And it's really a series of vertices and lines connecting them. So if you were going to spray paint something, you could either spray inside of it or maybe make it spray out. I did both on Ori, but the way I kind of thought about that in this example is what if you were to like over spray this? So if you sprayed it, the spray paint would fall outside of the geometry. So it's very rough drawing here, but you know, you find all your vertices, you find all the lines that connect them, and then you find the perpendicular angle 
And that's where you want to kind of shoot out your spray paint. So you go kind of like segment by segment and shoot stuff out from those lines perpendicular. Um, and then you hit the angles. So the actual vertices, you know, if you only shot out from the lines, you would get kind of missed areas. So you have to take each vertice and calculate the angle there and then spray out from there. Um, and then hopefully you'll achieve this effect. And what I wanted to show here really is like, as you're closer to these lines, the density of the paint is higher. And then sometimes less so, it shoots out further. So when it comes to that density, it's not linear. It's really more of like exponential. So there's a lot of density by the shape. And then as you get further away, you get less and less of it. So that's conceptually how it worked. Uh, there was a lot of like scratching on my notepad, trying to figure out what I wanted to do and then coding it and seeing if it would work or not. Uh, I don't have a background in math. And so then the next thing I'll scroll down and kind of show you that in action with some pieces in Ori. So I just highlighted all the vertices on this piece right here. And you can kind of see uh, the same idea where like, you know, between these two vertices, it's shooting out red paint and then also kind of on the vertice as well. And if we scroll down some more, here's just another example of that where you can see basically almost all the shapes in Ori are touched by spray paint. So there's a, a number of passes that occur. So at first they're kind of solid, then there's a gradient that's applied. Then there's a internal spray paint mode where um, if you look here, you'll see there's like kind of light spray paint and then there's dark spray paint over here. So I like tuned all these colors in one by one where a uh, fill in Ori is actually the composition of a number of different colors, and there's a level of variability between each. And then sometimes with some colors, they get blown out like this. And this is kind of like a big moment when I started to dabble into this because it really made it stand out and be a little bit more unique. Where these pieces of geometry, if they're this color, they have a probability of getting kind of destroyed in a sense. And as mentioned, there's a number of different modes that Ori goes through when it creates itself. You can actually kind of see it fill in if you watch the real the, or the live view. Um, what you don't see necessarily is the middle phases. And this is an example of that. So I kind of start off with all of the solid fills here in this first image. And then the gradients are applied and they're very subtle, but they are there. So if you look kind of up here, you'll see it. This one's got actually like a radial gradient in the middle that goes out. And in some pieces of Ori, that'll be a linear gradient. Sometimes it's a radial gradient, but it's very subtle and it's a, uh, it's a feature, but it's not public. So you have to kind of use your eye to figure out where that happens. So then after that's filled in, there's other passes. Um, so this is the final image and there's basically this post-processing pass where those blowouts occur. And there's kind of large pieces of spray paint, like blobs that are added on the canvas. And this is what in isolation that looks like. So you can see here, there's essentially just like spray paint that's thrown onto the canvas. And it's oftentimes, if I were to show you this like superimposed with the geometry, it's around it. So it's kind of like emitting just a little bit of big spray paint generally which leads to this kind of overall messy effect, which I really like. And then when it comes to specific pieces of the geometry, it gets like fully blown out, which you can kind of see here. So when you put it all together, you get a final piece. Um, but the important thing to note is there's so many layers of it. And I spent so much time figuring <laughs> out the right size and dynamics to it. So the background gets spray paint, the foreground gets spray paint, Generally, the foreground gets sprayed out, and then this glow effect is applied. And then finally, there's this really big kind of blobs of spray paint that gets blasted on the canvas, too, which you can really see up here. So there's like many different layers of it, and they all kind of work in their own. And then there's the drip effect, which is kind of a simulation of that that targets parts of the canvas and makes them drip occasionally. It depends on the attributes. So some pieces of Ori have a lot of that and some don't have that much. Very cool. That's awesome. I appreciate you sharing all that. You know, and um, you talked about the, the core algorithm incorporates geometric 
folding of polygons. And, you know, many of us are familiar, we've heard of origami, but you also mentioned in the project description, kirigami, which is the act of folding and cutting paper. And I'm curious to know, like, how is this incorporated into your project? Yeah, so the idea of folding paper, um, it's, let's go and actually look at it. So it's something that's interesting to me because if you hold up a piece of paper, you have essentially four points. And then if you draw a line between it, you can take those points and bend them around. And that's how a fold occurs. And the best way to, to really illustrate it is to animate it. So this is kind of where the promo video came from. But the idea of uh, showing people how their pieces of Ori gets folded. So if we look at this, we can see it morphing around and these are all folds occurring and slight bits of like the kirigami style of cutting gets uh introduced so if you look very closely here let me slow it down here you can see that like things are getting distorted and moved and it's not a big effect but this area up here in particular got kind of cut and shifted and that's what i mean when i say like a kirigami style effect occurs but that doesn't always occur so much like origami there's a bunch of different instruction books you can follow and with ori there's different styles of folding technique that are introduced and that's called the fold strategy cool that's awesome and something that's obviously very striking and something i always love talking about with artists is our, our, our color palettes and you've also selected you've selected an incredible you know, variety of colors throughout this project. And, you know, I'm curious to know where you got inspiration from for selecting the actual colors. Yeah, so I iterated a lot on the colors and I try to use a diversity of different sources. So if you go to my micro site, you can actually get a decent view of all of them. And one of the interesting things I, interesting things I wanted to include was kind of inspiration uh, with a direct source. So for the Montana color palette, um, I really looked at interesting colors in landscape photography. And before I, anyone calls it out, this is actually Arizona, <laughs> but <laughs> there's a uh, spray paint company called Montana Colors. So I just really, that resonated with me. So I kind of fudged it. And I feel like I need to mention that before people are like, dude, that photo is not Montana. <laughs> <laughs> um, and then with others like, you know, Amused is very much a graffiti-derived color palette, um, whereas Briss is actually inspired by digital art. And I would love to showcase a good friend of mine, Kervin, who let me use essentially his artwork as inspiration. So he um, does a lot of a really amazing illustrations, and he's in depth core as well. So one day while he was posting his works in progress and I was posting mine, I was like, what if I used your colors? And after getting permission from him, I did and just kind of pulled those in. So if you look through his portfolio, he has just such amazing stuff. And I really love the like bold black, white, and then highlight color effect that he has in a lot of his work. Um, and even some of his pattern work is a happy coincidence that that kind of fell into Ori as well. So that's kind of the origin behind Briss. And then, um, you know, a lot of these are just a lot of trial and error and making, you know, 20 color palettes and then refining them down. But Cloud was one of the first ones that just stuck. So when I first started working on Ori, Cloud was like the color palette that I think I might have made first or second. And I just really liked it and never got rid of it. Whereas many others had to be like tuned up over time or discarded uh, because it just didn't always look right. Um, and then Exodus is one of the color palettes people seem to really like. And this is actually, it started as another color palette that we'll look at a little bit later that just didn't really make the cut, but I knew I wanted something with a really bold background. So Exodus was my answer to that. I wanted yellow and I wanted something like really kind of shocking. And that's where Exodus kind of came from. So these little uh, color bars here are actually balanced for the like, probability of the color occurring in the palette so you'll see that yellow is very high probability it's kind of balanced with this this dark color here and then um you know this more tan color gray color much less so so you get to kind of as you look at the site see why the colors appear when they do 
And the really interesting thing is, although there is a probability, there's no guarantee. So there are always edge cases where there's examples of colors that should be there that just don't appear. And, and how do you and then, actually? Oh, uh, 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 yeah. Sorry, I was just gonna ask. Like, how do you actually name the the palettes themselves? I know you know one of the palettes was inspired from one of your friends who creates art. And then, you know, I'm curious, like cloud, is that, are you have a, do you love going outside and enjoying the different, you know, shapes and things that you can see in clouds or yeah. How do you come up with the actual names themselves? Yeah. I, I, I kind of feel like whatever pops in my head at the time, um, there's loosely maybe a connection at times to the names and the actual colors that are in the palettes, but it's really just an exercise in like, what am I kind of thinking about at the time when I developed the palette and like gum, for example, is like bubble gum in a sense. Uh, and it's just really that, like, I don't really try to think too much about it and make the world's most interesting color names. I like to just like the color speak for themselves and give them a name. So people know what to refer to them as, but it's really just like off the cuff, what's going on in my head at any given time. Cool. So the thing with gum too is, Gum has the highest probability of overspraying its boundaries. So if you look at a lot of the examples, they're oftentimes like highly dynamic and really messy. So I just wanted to call that out because they also take the longest to render because it's expensive to do that. So gum is the one where it's like, I had to really think about what I wanted that, but I just could not get away from the idea of like all of the pinks just like getting blasted out constantly. I really love that. And then screen time to me is totally like new dad mode when you got a baby, just like <laughs> typically the baby stays in your bedroom for the first like six months to a year. And like, you do not want to wake up that baby. So they go to sleep early. You got to kind of keep an eye on them. You might have the baby monitor, but a lot of times I found myself like me and my wife, just like sitting in the bed and like looking at our phones, just catching up on stuff and just like in the dark with like one little bright light. And I really wanted something like that just because that's what I went through when I was making this. Um, yeah. And I also wanted to play around with some of the like established ideas of Ori and change them around. So the other thing about screen time is almost all of the fill colors are the same and it's really just the outlines that are different colors. And then there's this, this exception of like this really bright kind of greenish color that pops and that almost always lights up. So again, kind of like what I was feeling at the time with like phones and all that kind of stuff. And then Skull and Zest, these are kind of like, it's hard to say what my favorites are, but I know my opinion of this project changed a lot when I saw Skull because I kind of put it together. I don't really know what to expect. And it's a weird color combo. There's like these like bright purples in it. And then there's kind of like this flamey color. And then there's a lot of red and really dark colors. And when I got to the point where that started tr getting translated into my outputs, it made me kind of like even more excited to work on the project because the results to me just like just inadvertently were cool. <laughs> like I didn't anticipate that. And a lot of it was just experimentation and same thing with zest. Like I really wanted another thing that was really bold and kind of digital art like. So when I put that together, I was like, Oh, all right. Like I got something I kind of like here that I didn't anticipate. I didn't use usual colors or complementary colors necessarily all the time. And the thing with zest too is like i feel like that's a polarizing color palette a lot of people don't like the bright green but i do so i, I had to put it in there like it had to go and i was going to kind of show you that like aha moment with skull where i was like oh like i got something here yeah so i just put like some of my first iterations that were in that color palette that just were like okay and it i think it informed a lot of the color palettes i created afterwards so the thing with Skull was the first time really that I had a, like a really contrasty background where you might get a very light color and a really dark color. And the colors that sit on top of it may also mimic one of those two lightness values. So you get things that are like obscured and maybe hidden into the background, but also pop really loud on top of it. And I just like couldn't get enough of it. So I really just felt like this was a turning point on the project. And these colors got tweaked a little bit before I released it, but for the most part, they've stayed the same. Very cool. And, 
you know, something that is, is, is easy for some of the features to, under, to understand exactly what they uh, do inside the actual Mint. But there's a couple of the features that I was curious about in, in Ori, um, such as complexity, one last bold, though, with a question mark at the end, and then uh, also just color mutation. If you don't mind, it'd be great to, you know, just tell us a little bit more about what these features mean. Totally. So the, the first one, complexify, is what I call it, which is not a word was just something that occurred to me, like jotting down on my notebook that I should try. So I also have this other invented word called reversions, I think. And it basically takes the geometry and like morphs it around and creates kind of this like magnified, but with an proximity effect. And it actually kind of reminds me of like what Ben Kovach did in edifices where like he has kind of this, a similar effect to an extent. And it was really an accident. Like when I implemented that, I was trying to do something else. I think I was trying to like rotate geometry without having to learn how to do matrix transformations, which I've since learned, but I didn't want to get into that at the time. It was going to like slow me down. So I was like trying to do it in other ways and I had an error and I liked the result. And after I did that, I got a very specific output. And while that was cool, it occurred to me that if I took my geometry and I added way more vertices, it would smooth out the effect. And that's what a complexified version is. So these are basically the same geometry, same hash, everything. But the only thing that's different is whether they're complexified or not. So if you look on the left, there's very few vertices. And on the right, I've peppered in a ton. So I basically took any line and figured out like if it's one and two vertices, add a bunch in the middle at a specific interval and you'll get like something that is more conducive to getting manipulated by a reversion, if that makes any sense. Um, on the second example, I think it's pretty clear on the bottom right, there's a, you know, kind of a, a square rectangle. And then on the right, there is very, a, a very smooth organic form. And that's the result of this kind of math glitch plus these extra vertices being um, implemented, but I like both. So that's why I added that as a feature because I like both examples. I feel like one of the things with worry is it can be quite angular. So if you kind of add the complexification, you get more organic kind of flowy forms. And I like that too. So I wanted both essentially. And then to really drive it home, here are the vertices. So I basically put this together to show you the difference in terms of how many points exist on each piece of geometry. So on the left, there's really not that many. There's only ever new points if they're defined in kind of the initial geometry, so like the paper, or if a line goes through them, that could create a couple points where it's cut essentially or folded. And then on the right, there's significantly more because uh, they get added, kind of peppered in. Cool, that's awesome. And you know, something that uh, I, I, I saw just a little bit on your website was the concept for the project began in November of 2021. So about a year ago. And I was interested to see because I, I know that when people, you know, start a project and when they get to the final product, it goes through so many different stages, so many different changes. And I was curious if you could show, you know, share some of those different stages of Ori over the last year of, of building. Yeah, this is really fun to put together because in some ways Ori has changed a lot. And then in other ways, like I was looking at the dates, I was like, wow, like I kind of got something here that wasn't that different from like where I ultimately took it. So let me pop back up to. Sorry, I'm just copying the link. No, that's fine. And how was it that over that last year, was it something where you took you know, breaks throughout the year? Or is it, were you just like hands down or heads down, you know, just like basically grinding away at this project? Or were you kind of just like here and there and until you found something you really, really liked? Um, it's a good question. I mean, I definitely took a couple breaks and worked on other things just to get my head clear of Ori like every now and again. But the hard part about developing like a long form project is it's really about creating opportunities and then having a sense for like a direction to kind of pursue that might take you interesting places. And I kind of felt like from the get go, I was like, okay, this could lead me somewhere, somewhere interesting, but I had to kind of grapple with the fact that there was like a very, very high level of variability 
and what the outputs looked like. So this is where it really started here. This is the implementation of the folding algorithm where like, you know, I had a polygon, I intersected it, I did my folds and I'd get these interesting results. But I would say probably like 40% of the time, the result was like really smushed. And I didn't like it, it wasn't good. So a lot of it was refinement, but I knew that this was kind of like a gateway to something interesting. So at first it really started as like, I want this to look kind of like paper. So as I scroll down, like this was a really naive implementation of paper texture with a little bit of shading on it. But I was like plotting all these dots and it started to occur to me that maybe I should like pivot to do more of a spray painty effect and then it clicked. And this is, kind of stuff that emerged as I was working on it. Like I didn't really have a plan in the beginning besides like, let's do like paper folding and see where we get. And then like the results just kept powering me in different directions. And I really love this one. And I still think this is one of the best outputs because it just creates a really nice contrast with the fold lines and the geometry. And this doesn't have any paint on it really. It's just strictly like subtle gradients and solid colors. This is an example of playing with like the background in a way that I didn't, it, the result wasn't pleasing, but I added it in here because I'm really just always trying new things, right? Like giving myself room to find new opportunities. And this is a very early gum example and probably the first implementation of like oversprays. And if you look really closely, all the pixels are kind of uniform in their size and they almost just look like dust. So obviously I improved on that, but this is where I started is I didn't like go from zero to perfect spray paint effect. I had to really iterate over it for uh, many times. This is a really early cloud. And this is also the first time I did kind of Kirigami style slicing. So you can see the geometry is like severed in the middle and shifted. And that's kind of where that effect came from. Uh, this is when I started playing with the idea of like having lots of pieces of paper. So there's like part, there's parts of Ori where there's like geo packing and it's like, well, what if instead of one piece of paper, you had 30 pieces of paper or hundred and what if they were different sizes or the same size, like playing around with that. And also this color scheme, I really liked it, but it didn't really ever reach my level of expectation. So I threw it away for a long time and then brought in, uh, Exodus, which is like got that yellow because I really knew I wanted that, but I wasn't sure how when I was kind of going through this. And then there's like the flock uh, style of geometry. This is a very early example of that where I was like, oh, it's kind of cool. Like it showcases some motion. And although I don't love this output necessarily, the fact that they kind of almost go off a waterfall was interesting to me because that geometry really came from the like flocking algorithm examples. You see, if you visit like the P5 documentation, et cetera, where it like looks like little birds in the air that follow your cursor, but they all kind of like work together to get there and they don't like bump into one another necessarily. That's just like a cool primitive in generative art that I've always just kind of liked it as a basic thing. And that's how it kind of made its way into Ori. And this is where the glitch happened that caused reversions. And I still love this piece. I have no idea how I made it, but it shows that like you could take the geometry and just like blow it out and make this basically like bullet hole in the middle. And when I did that, it created all these really awesome stripes in the bottom that are really just kind of like in some ways uniform, in some ways more outward and different. And I just really loved that effect. And this was like another aha moment where I was like, oh, I have something here. So I took that and I reversed the numbers and I created like these inward reversions where I would like suck stuff in like a black hole and spit it out in different directions. I didn't really like that result necessarily, but uh, there's a little, there's a very minor touch of that in some of the mints, but this is like an extreme example of that. So I had the idea, I was like, well, it's spray paint, so it drips occasionally. So this is a very early implementation of the drip effect that made it into the production release. And this is just like all over the place. And here it's way too long. So I definitely tuned in like how much the drips live before they stop, because otherwise it doesn't really look like drips. It looks like something else. And this is in February. So if you look at these outputs, like there's all the pieces of Ori are here essentially, but it was last February. So it was a long way before 
where it got in the end, but it has a lot of those basic elements. And around this time, I was getting these really minimal outputs, which I love. Like, I like the really basic ones. So these, to me, just have, like, just the right ingredients and nothing else. And there's just enough interest there. And it's very easy to make things overwhelmingly detailed. And many Ori pieces have an extreme amount of detail. So when you see one that doesn't have a lot, I like those even more. Uh, this is last March, and this is where I started introducing the line work that I use in a lot of plotter art. So I call these kind of like null colors where the fill doesn't get put in and it doesn't spray paint, but instead it just puts line work in there and it adds something different to the whole project. And this is where that really started at. And then this iteration just randomly popped up and I was like, whoa, how did that happen? <laughs> so I... I really love the like weird symmetry and almost like it almost looks like a diamond here, but it's also really kind of smooth and organic. And this piece still calls out to me and I'm like, I don't think we'll ever see another one like that again, but it just got, it just got such a cool movement to it because it kind of trails down into the left, like a runway or a road or something where it like leads you up into the piece. And like, you couldn't make this again if you tried, it was just like a random occurrence. And then this palette, while well, I liked it, yeah, it did die. So here's some of the cooler examples um, where like you would get kind of this hodgepodge and the actual foreground geometry was either white or black essentially. And the background did all the color work. And that was kind of cool to play with, but it didn't always work for me. So, uh, so I got rid of it, but when it worked well, I really liked the results. And this is an example of where like you see that this is a circle, but it's all kind of like deconstructed and also tilted and it has some perspective to it, which is just, again, completely unintentional, but I just love this result. And you'll see too, that there's like kind of that macro level, like really big spray paint in this piece. And this is where that came from. So this is kind of an April where I started thinking about that. And it was around this point that I, um, submitted it to art blocks. So I don't know if there's a lot of other artists that do this, but I went all the way from like, never been on art blocks to curated just with one project. So that was another reason why Ori took quite a long time because like a lot of it was like working with art blocks, getting feedback, thinking through it, taking my, like giving it my take and then applying it in certain um, examples. But like I worked with Art Blocks through a lot of this, and Art Blocks and me really started talking in April. Um, so you know, mid May, this is where like Brisk kind of came into the picture, and the folding started getting more dialed in. So I really loved this one because it's like a good balance of really big pieces of geometry and then really small ones, and they have sort of a relationship with one another. So this is almost like a little digital river floating through the middle of the piece surrounded by these really big pieces of like paper essentially. And then there were outputs, like there was a lot of experimentation still going on. So this one was like all the fold lines were essentially just vertical and you get these very interesting compositions. This is where like I had my kind of aha moment with the skull palette. It re re reju rejuvenated me essentially um, because I just really felt like this palette was different. And I just really loved it. And I could look at it for like hours on end, which is definitely a requirement of building out projects like this. And at this time, playing with the different ways of folding paper and scaling them, I started getting into this like bigger picture stuff where the geometry is front and center. It takes up most of the canvas. It's not zoomed in or zoomed out necessarily, but it fills the whole canvas. And then I went through my zest phase. So really just tuning in this uh, color palette and really loving the results. So is that so kind of the, towards the yeah. end, sorry, to, because I, I know you, you mentioned Zest, which is one of the color palettes that made it to the end. Is that something that, you know, the color palettes, is that something you kind of work on throughout the project? Or is it something you focus on towards the end where after you get kind of get like the shape and, and style locked in? I th it's throughout the project because I feel like it gets boring just doing like the hardcore math stuff. And then like it's mm -hmm. fun to play around with color for a day or two or like 
line work for a day or two and just like keep kind of rotating around all the components that comprise like a long form art project. And it's just like a nice break to get your head out of like maybe something that you've been in for a couple of weeks and maybe you're like stumbling through, step away, work on color, get some new perspective, look at the project in a different light. And then like, as you do that, you create opportunities to get new insights on things maybe you've looked at in depth. Like you're just like out of it and you need to get back into it. And I feel like that's really important. Got it. And, and you kind of mentioned, you know, the whole spray can effect is really cool, especially with the, you know, kind of the, the drippage at the end when you kind of destroy the artwork. Was that, was that something you, you kind of envisioned from the, the beginning or, you know, I guess tell us a little bit about why uh, you added that into the project. Yeah, so that effect essentially was there really early. Um, so I think like we looked at, you know, in the early part of 2021, I was implementing those drips. And I really liked that effect. And part of telling the story of Ori is for me, at least with a background in animation, showing it to people as opposed to explaining it to them. So as I was developing uh, the micro site, I wanted to show like, what are these drips? What do they look like if they aren't there and then they appear? Like, what does that look like? And I figured out that it wasn't that hard to just add that in. And I really loved that effect. And I really want Ori to be seen in multiple different contexts. So whether you own a print or just the NFT or you own a digital screen or a plotter drawing, et cetera, et cetera. Like, I want you to be able to look at it from multiple different angles. And when it comes to like really high quality, big screens, I feel like Ori is going to shine there. And I like the idea of making it a little dynamic. So there's actually two animation modes in Ori. And one is the like forever drip that destroys the painting. And that's kind of a callback to in graffiti, how nothing's permanent and everything is slowly either destroyed or buffed or we're painted over usually. Um, and then there's a second animation mode, which I don't know if a lot of people have discovered yet, but if you hit a key again, you basically get your worry. It stays there. The drips kind of appear and then disappear over time. That's really meant for displays. Got it. Oh, that's super cool. And and what about, um, I, I know you mentioned also on, I think, Twitter that the first 25 minters received a bonus. And I'm curious to know, like, what was that bonus? I know you've kind of hinted also about, you know, uh, plotted pieces. Is that something that is offered to everyone or or what is that? Yeah, so some of this stuff is still being defined, but the first 25 people are going to get an animation of how their piece of work is folded. So I kind of showed you a little bit earlier, and I'll show you another one now, where when you own an Ori, you can like look at it, and it might be hard to figure out how it came together. But I really wanted to provide really like an example of that to, to people who bought into the project, who thought it was cool, and it caught their attention. So you'll get one of these, which is essentially you're Ori in dynamic motion. And they're really crazy looking because like the colors shift and they flicker and like the paint's just like all over the place. And I kind of love them for that. They're very like spastic, but they're also very smooth. So I like tweened in how all those folds work and how they move and how the Kirigami elements shift around. Very cool. That's awesome. And, and what about... Uh plotted pieces is that i feel like i saw something on was that twitter on the discord you mentioned is that available to some people uh yeah so there will be some plotted pieces um i'm currently in the studio working on them now so check these out real quick i'm super excited about them but they're 60 70 percent maybe yeah, yeah so again it's all about different perspectives on the same thing and I wrote a vector renderer for Ori that basically takes all that line work and makes it so it can be written and read by a plotter and then drawn in ink. So you'll get these really cool kind of like clean versions of Ori. Um, and here's actually Mint Zero. So I'm going to offer these to people. Um, pricing, sizing, all that kind of stuff, not clear yet. I'm focusing on making a really high quality interesting product and going back to kind of some of my other plotter work the idea of taking them and adding watercolor potentially just to create subtle shading right because everything is shaded and worry the line work won't give you that necessarily but what if i could go in there and do that myself by hand like i think that'd be cool for some collectors who want to own something where 
it's digital and physical, but also handmade by me as well. Definitely. I think that's a, just a really nice touch that you've added um, to this project. And, you know, I'm, I'm also interested, uh, I know we're kind of keeping an eye on time, but what are some of those mints or personal favorites from Ori that, uh, that kind of spoke to you? Are you able to share a couple of those with us? Yeah. So let's go over quickly, just some of the surprising ones. Cause there's definitely yeah. interesting stuff that happened. I anticipate it. So mint nine and 299 are interesting to me. They're actually like good siblings because they're both screen times, but they're not really distorted. <laughs> like they have cool backgrounds and stuff, but the distortion is extremely minimal. So I really thought that was interesting. Um, and unexpected because typically things get highly deformed. And then the next thing is uh, things that have the Exodus color palette, but they don't have that striking bold yellow. They only have the other kind of complementary colors. They're definitely eye catching. And then this one is mint number 83. Uh, this is an exclusified color palette. So you asked about that earlier, but that's when the color palette gets reduced into maybe different background colors, but only a single solo foreground color. And it leads to some interesting results. And for some reason, some of the dots didn't <laughs> come up on this one. So typically they're like <laughs> organized in a way where you get like a row of like three, but there's only two at the bottom and two in these top areas. I, I don't know why, but I'm not mad at it. And then this mint number 99 has this like subtle curve to it and it's not complexified. And I have no idea how or why that showed up. So I put vertices on it last night and I still don't really know why, uh, but it's got that subtle curve on there and everything's usually very angular and exact with Wordy. So I don't know why. Um, this is mint number 275. And I really like it because when the sprays, like the oversprays overlap, they'll create their own gradient. And that's kind of what happened here. So that's not intended. And it's kind of rare that like the oversprays, there's a lot of them. And if they're next to another, that's like very rare. So it could be like really any piece of geometry that just happen to be connected, which is kind of a cool effect. Very cool. Then I'll just show you this one before we jump over to the mints I like the most. Um, but this is an odd composition. <laughs> so there's not much overspray. So there's only like a little bit up here. It's very large. There's like something different or missing that just like for my eye at least leads to me like kind of like thinking about it. And then you get like this really nice kind of triangle here that leads your eye down in some ways where there's the most complexity out of all, all of it. And then I'm just going to jump over to my favorites real quick. Yeah, yeah, definitely. It's got to be hard. I'm always like scared to ask people like, all right, what's your favorite? Because then you're like picking your favorite like kids almost, you know, in a way it's from zero it's hard. Project, but yeah, it's got to be tough. <laughs> it's really hard. Yeah. I mean, like there's just some that there's like this immediate effect I get when I see something where I'm like, huh. <laughs> and looking yeah. at like literally tens of thousands of these things, like I know when that happens <laughs> and that's kind of where this list came from. So this one just popped as like, Oh yeah, there's something here. Cause it's another exclusified color palette. And I just really like the colors. I really like the shapes that came out of it. And it's also a writer, which is like got kind of graffiti shape to it. That was the intention of that geometry. And this one just like popped. I don't know why. And this one, uh, this is mint number 88. This one in the thumbnail looked very 3D to me because the shading just works. And it looked again like it was kind of sitting off the canvas. And I just really love that. This is 416. And this one I, it reminds you of the sun. So in the center of like the reversion thing that magnifies the geometry also just so happened to be the one area where you get the really like orange, yellow uh, uh, color here. And they just like overlap perfectly. And it seems like everything's like rotating around it, which I thought was really nice. The number, mint number 57, it's just a really good bris. Like I really mm -hmm. like the, the flow on this, right? It kind of like arcs around something and it just works really well for me. And if I had to choose one, this might be my favorite. It's so hard to say, but you have to look really close on this. So this is a 110. 
And the thing that's really interesting about this is it doesn't have any slicing lines. So that's another thing that is uh, not a documented feature, but exists. So you have to look out for it. So like I said, folder line, slicing line, same thing, but the like distinctive line work in Ori, it sometimes doesn't show up. And this is an example of that. And I just love the composition. I love that that's there. And I really love how sometimes the geometry will kind of layer on itself. And you're going to get like line work in this one that overlays other pieces of geometry and the colors being the same, but subtly different is really nice. And I just love how it kind of closes itself out with this piece down here. And if you look very, very closely, uh, it's line work, but it also has another undocumented feature called visual vertices. So you'll mm. see little tiny dots for the vertices on this thing that works with the line work and it just pops so well. So I just really love this piece. Um, I do love them all. This one just <laughs> for whatever reason does it for me. Uh, and then I'll just, I'll call it this one too, because this one's like more minimal. So there's not a lot of colors. There's a lot of uh, missing colors and line work here as well. That's a cool one. It also reminds, that one right there specifically, what's the number on that specific mean? 207. 207. That one looks like a satellite in the sky or something. It looks really, really cool. I like the contrast on that one a lot. Cool. Yeah. Well, let's well let's uh um wrap things up. Um, you know, as as far as Ori's concerned, um, I'm I'm curious. You know, for future projects, Ori, you know, is obviously fantastic. But for future projects, do you typically you know build off the style you've used in previous projects, or do you start completely from scratch? So it's hard to say. I think there will be some sort of spray element going forward in some of my works. I really want to challenge assumptions about generative art and do things in different ways. So a lot of where I'm at right now is coming up conceptually with something that maybe hasn't been done before um, that could be like a game changer, right? So kind of in the workshop thinking through all of that and how that translate visually, like I still haven't actually thought a ton about that. I want to make something that's just fundamentally different and where that leads may definitely incorporate parts of Ori. And I will say the other thing that was nice about this project is I built a system for making generative art. I'm certainly going to use that. So I have all this like tooling now that allows me to like quickly iterate and also look at long form projects and find outliers. So I'm definitely going to reuse all of that. And I've actually open sourced part of that too. So if people are interested, check out my GitHub and you can use the same starter I'm going to use, which will give you hopefully a leg up in your ability to just iterate quickly on your project. Awesome. Yeah. We'll include that in the show notes of, of the video. And I think it's worth mentioning your website. It's a uh, ori.lostpixels.io. We'll include that as well in the show notes. Um, one last thing I want to talk about real quick about Ori is, do you have any plans for, an exhibit or, you know, showcasing this work in some capacity either next year or in the future? I'm certainly open to that. I don't have any plans right now. Okay, great. Yeah, I, th I think you were kind of talking about seeing Ori on such a large scale on a digital screen to kind of see all those details would be really, really cool to see. So we'll keep an eye out for that. Um, you know, we met in, uh, I met James in, in Marfa just a couple weeks, I think a couple days before the project was released. And I got to ask, you know, how was your experience in Marfa? You know, you were there before you released anything on Artbox, which I think is really cool to kind of, it, it sounded like you were committed to just be a part of Artblocks. And we're, we're just so grateful to have you on the platform. But yeah, what brought you to Marfa? And, and what was your experience like? Yeah, I'm still processing it. So <laughs> I wasn't going to go when I heard about it. <laughs> I was like, there's no way it's like too far out there. And then I started to realize that people were traveling from like around the world to go to Marfa. And I was like, there's something interesting there. I don't know what, and I'm not going to try to figure out what necessarily. I'm just going to go and see it for myself. And it was definitely worth it. So if you get the opportunity, anyone, I would certainly go. And the really cool thing about it is you like walk around town and then you just meet other artists and you're like, whoa, we're like instantly best friends <laughs> because like we, I can resonate so closely with so many other people because we all do this weird thing where we like, subject ourselves to the trials and tribulations of building long form generative art projects. There's not many people like that, but there was a bunch of them in Marfa. So I could like walk up and meet like, like Matto and just be like, dude, what's up? And he'd be like, Hey, how's it going? And he'd like tell you about what he's working on. Right. And like get into in-depth conversations about just very specific things related to generative art. 
and just learn so much from other people and just be a part of that and learn about their projects. So to me, I'm still reeling from it. Like I absolutely loved it. And later on to meeting like the curators who were involved in art blocks and the collectors who are so passionate about it, who know the artwork like the back of their hand. Like it's just really a magical experience and it's unlike anything else. Cool. Yeah. It was so nice to meet you. And I, I completely agree. It's Marfa, I think is a special place. And obviously for people to come from all over the world and travel many, many hours or days even to get there, it was such a special moment. So uh, yeah, really glad to, to meet you there and, and talk to you before you launch your project. Um, one thing I want to ask before we wrap things up is, you know, we, we kind of talked about it on the pre-drop talk about mental health and how important it is, I think, in this space. Um, do you have any advice to, you know, other artists or even collectors, like ways that you maybe yourself carve out time to either get away from the space or to kind of reset and recharge? Yeah, I mean, it's definitely tricky. I think part of it is like knowing your goal and what you're signing yourself up for and preparing for it. So like for me, I think the biggest surprise about working on Ori was just the amount of visual information you have to process to build one of these things out. So what I mean by that is like, you're looking at your algorithm for months on end and thousands of versions of it. And that can lead to burnout on its own. So figuring out how to limit that is really important, but you have to do it. So if you really want to do this thing, you have to commit to that, I think at least, like, because that level of like consistent variability leading to quality is a really hard to equation to crack. And you have to work hard on that. So I think a lot of it is just like having realistic expectations. And then another part of it is like taking a break and having fun from it. So you don't want to like kill yourself in JavaScript and hate it. You really want to continuously get these like insights and this joy out of working on it. I know for me, at least when I solve like a hard problem, like the spray paint problem, like it makes me just feel inherently happy. And that's why I keep doing this. And it's like, part of that is understanding what you know and you don't know and slowly incrementally building up your knowledge so that you build that confidence and being okay with the idea that there's some things that you're just not, maybe not gonna be good at, right? Like I'm not ever gonna be good at trigonometry. I'm really terrible with matrix transformations, mm -hmm. but I have like a basic understanding now that makes me really happy just personally. So beyond everything else, like, Worry, although challenging, made me just get way more in depth in the weeds of like math. And it was really rewarding for that reason. So I think it is all about like doing it for the reasons that mean the most to you, whether it's like the pursuit of knowledge, whether it's making a statement, all of that, um, and just taking breaks. <laughs> like, yeah. and I would take breaks and write other programs, but make them very loose and not care and not refine them just because I do love inherently programming and I love math and I love art, but I don't want to like make that something I hate because I like force myself into this little pigeonhole. So to me, it was like, yeah, taking breathers, just working with the community too. Like there's so many amazing people out there who love to talk about this stuff and we'll look at your work and give you different opinions and all that, like all that's so important. Absolutely. Well, I appreciate you sharing that with us. Um, finally, how can people reach you? Should they have any questions? Maybe you have social media plugs or anything you want to share? Yeah, I mean, definitely check out my website, lostpixels.io. Um, hit me up on Instagram at lostpixels or on Twitter at to the pixel. Someone took lost the pixels, but to the <laughs> pixel on that one. Uh, yeah, cool. hit me up. I was down the chat. Awesome. Well, James, thanks so much for, for being on After Dinner Minutes. It's been a pleasure talking to you about Ori, which is such an amazing release on Artblocks, curated, and yeah, excited to see what you do next. Awesome. Thanks so much for your time, Tanya. Absolutely. Um, just a couple news and notes for everyone. Uh, After Dinner Mint's discussions are available as a podcast. They're available bi-weekly via Spotify, Apple, and Amazon. Finally, we have a weekly newsletter that gets delivered once a week with information on upcoming releases and generative art-related news. You can find a link to the newsletter in the description of this YouTube video. Again, I want to thanks, uh, thank James Merrill for joining me on After Dinner Minutes. It's been a pleasure talking to you. Uh, for everyone tuning in, make sure you comment, like, and subscribe to our YouTube channel. Be kind to each other, buy what you love, and we will see you all next week. Thanks, James. Thank you.